Hello, and welcome to the Merrill Opera Program Season Preview Event. I'm Jean Kellogg, Executive Director of Merrill, and I'm honored to introduce our two wonderful guests today. Sherry Greenwald is the Director of the San Francisco Opera Center and Artistic Director of Merrill Opera Program since 2002. She's an internationally acclaimed soprano who has sung worldwide. As a matter of fact, Act. She has sung the role of Susanna and the Count in the Notte Figaro numerous times and has always been inspired by Postcard from Morocco and Dominic Argento's works. She will have great insights into the characters and stories of both of these operas. Dr. Clifford Kip Krenna is dramaturg emeritus at San Francisco Opera, where he was on the music staff for 40 years. He has managed more than 20 opera commissions for San Francisco Opera, and most recently, If I Were You by Jake Heggie, which premiered at Merrill in 2019. Kip is a frequent guest lecturer on opera throughout the Bay Area, and he has much to enlighten us on these two inspired operas. I wanted to mention that if you have a question you want to ask, please do so in the chat line, and following the event, after Kip and Sherry have finished finished speaking, um, I will come back on and ask the questions of them for you. So please join me in welcoming Sherry Greenwald and Kip Crana. Here we are. Good evening, Hello. everyone. Thank you for joining us and uh, thanks for supporting Marilla. It's great to have you with us tonight as we talk about Marilla 2021. Sherry, it's been an unusual year for Marilla, hasn't it? It certainly has. It's. Um, we we did determine once it was clear that we couldn't go ahead with the program in the summer we did put together a four-week um sort of virtual quasi program you know really wasn't a program but it kept the kids engaged and we did a lot of language and um coachings uh, so that was a fun summer hopefully that kept some of the kids engaged anyway and then of course we decided that we would just move these operas into next summer and keep the same cast. So that right. made it fairly easy. Well, speaking of these operas, let's talk about them. In order to do that, I'm going to start sharing the screen here because I have a PowerPoint with some video and we'll uh, talk about both these operas and Sherry, you can give us your insights and we'll talk about the Marilini as well. So let me get into this and uh, Start should be able to see the screen now with my PowerPoint on it, and I'm going to start from the beginning. And uh, there we are. There's our uh, title slide from the from Mozart to the surreal. So uh, we'll start with the surreal, which is. I just uh, want to point out that that photo was of our last production of Postcard from Morocco, uh, with AJ Gluckert there in the front. Uh, right. He's now fest in Frankfurt, doing very well for himself. He was an Adler fellow as well. But I always love that picture. I think it's such a beautiful photo. Right. And it really shows what the, the opera is all about. with a great ensemble uh, yes. opera, isn't it? So, so this is our uh, promo. I won't read this to you. You can read it yourself. But it does point out the, uh, the very international group we've got coming this year, from people from all over, uh, uh, including uh, Europe, which isn't uh, uh, too usual for us. So that's exciting. And yeah. um, we start out, uh, th this, by the way, is a shot of all the Marilini, and we'll talk about them individually as we go along. But it's quite a lovely group. And uh, so glad that we're able to bring them back next year. And uh, too bad for they had to sit out a year, but uh, we look forward to seeing them again. Um, so Postcard from Morocco uh, by Dominic Argento. Sherry, tell us why uh, you decided to program this piece. Well, I'm a fan of Dominic Argento's music. Uh, he's a Midwesterner like I am. So maybe it has to do that we both have uh, that Midwestern flavor to us, I guess. And um, I got to meet Dominic. Uh, his student was Stephen Paulus. And Stephen had written an opera called The Woman at Ottawa Crossing that we premiered at Opera Theater of St. Louis. And Dominic came down to see that. And I was lucky enough to get to sit next to Dominic Argento at a luncheon and pick his brain a little bit. And that was such a wonderful experience. He was a lovely, lovely man. And um, so I'm a big fan of this work. And there's, they were inspired by the Robert Louis Stevenson uh, Child's Garden of Verses. And I'm um, a big fan of poetry, of course. And so I started to look through the, the, the poetry, the, the 
the Garden of Verses, and I found the pirate story. Um, and for me, this is the thing that had to have inspired him. Three of us afloat in the meadow by the swing, three of us aboard in the basket on the lee, Winds are in the air, they are blowing in the spring, and waves are on the meadow like the waves there are at sea. Where shall we adventure today that we're afloat, weary of the weather and steering by a star? Shall it be to Africa, a steering of the boat, to Providence, or Babylon, or off to Malabar? Hi, but there's a squadron a-rowing on the sea, cattle on the medding a-charging with a roar. Quick, and we'll escape them, they're as mad as they can be. The wicked is the harbor, and the garden is the shore. When I was a young girl, my brother and I, we lived in a town called Morley, Iowa. Morley, Iowa is a town of maybe 100 people. I was the paper girl, so I should know. And um, <laughs> the nearest swimming pool was 35 miles away. So obviously, we didn't get to the swimming pool. So my brother and I would mow with our hand mower the, the grass into the shape of a swimming pool. and and mow out a diving board and we'd pretend to dive in. So when I read this poem, and, and in the opera you will see, we have some excerpts that sort of show that he's thinking about his childhood as well, Mr. Owens. And there's just something about staring up through the grass, you know, at the animals coming at you and feeling very small, and but feeling the grass very tall. And that's sort of one of the reasons I love this opera. <laughs> Well, let's listen to the aria that is based, uh, inspired by this poem, uh, you know, a, a young boy imagining himself sailing off. Uh, the aria begins this way uh, in postcard. Once when I was a young man, I imagined I saw a magical sailing vessel. It floated by my bedroom window, resting in the branches of the trees, anchoring by a steeple, washing shallow in a port of clouds. The captain beckoned to me, bid me come aboard. He offered me his wheel and his cap with feathers. He called the wind to fill the cloth. He blew his whistle and the ropes danced round the mast. He fired cannons and a flag stretched out open-handed. It was the color of the blanket on my bed. I cried aloud and spied from on the sill, my fleet off in the distance resting in a forest top. So having set up all that, then he gets into this lovely quiet moment in the middle of his aria. It's really lovely, isn't it, Sherry? Uh, which well, I love open fifths. Uh, mm -hmm. I, the, the use of the open fifths, the rocking, you know, the rocking of the melody, which is like being on the ocean. And yeah. um, I wish that we could play a little more, but Boozy and Hawks, uh, the publisher of this opera, contacted us today and said, you can only use three minutes. <laughs> so we can't waste all our three minutes on poor Mr. Owen, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is our... Uh, creative team for the show, Anthony Walker and, and David Garrison. And, you, and our, um, our members will know Anthony Walker. He's conducted for us several times. And he's a singer's conductor. He was a singer himself as a young man. And so he knows what it is to breathe with a singer. I'm, I always admire his work. And David is, of course, David Garrison w was on um, Married with Children for many years an actor. He's, uh, I know him because he was my frosh 
in Santa Fe, many, many, many performances of Fledermaus. And David and I became friends. And so I've always poked at him and said I wanted him to direct for me. And I, he's excited to do this now. I think it took him a while to get into the genre, into the music itself. But now I'll just give you little hints of what he's thinking. This may not be a train station at all, although it may look like a train station. You might be in limbo. You're just not quite sure. And the thing I pointed out to David was that Mr. Owen is the only one with a real name. And maybe he ain't going to the other place. <laughs> so, oh. so we have we have thoughts about Mr. Owens. So and also he's thinking that the characters are coming from different periods of time. Oh, as well. interesting. So right. there, there there will be someone from the 1890s and someone from the 20s, and so they're all coming from different periods of time as well. Fascinating. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned you met uh, Dominic, uh, who died tragically last year, but he had a wonderful um, life up to age 91, and he spent his uh, career in Minneapolis, and uh, uh, here are the operas that he has done. Uh, quite a uh, if you're opera folks, and I know you are, you've heard of some of these. There's Postcard, of course, uh, from 1971. Uh, have you sung in any of these, uh, Sherry? Any of these no, songs? but actually I have directed Miss Havisham's Fire, uh -huh. which is a great piece. And I've also seen Miss Havisham's, well, no, Fire is the complete one and Wedding Night is the short one. I've directed the short one, whichever of those it is. Right. Um, but I did see the full version of it as well in Opera Theatre St. Louis, and it's a <clears> wonderful work. Of course, it's based on the Dickens, and so it's a great oh, story. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. Miss Havisham, what a character. Oh, goodness, yes. The monologue, Miss Havisham's Wedding Night, is more or less just a monologue for the soprano. I wish I'd have found that when I was singing, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been my meat and potatoes. Well, let's uh, meet uh, Dominic. Here's a little bit of an interview with him. Yeah. What I do is write music. It's been something I've wanted to do since I was 14 years old. And I have been doing it that long, which means I've been doing it over 70 years. And here's a little bit more of this interview continued. I was told back east in Pennsylvania, where I'm born in New York, where I was hoping to get a job. I was told that I was committing cultural suicide to move to the Midwest. I came here, my first and only job, I fell in love with the Twins today. The people here are more genuine about their feelings for art, their support of art, and the quantity of art that surrounds us here. I love everything that happens here. I feel more at home here than I would have felt any other place in the world. I was told back east. You don't need that I'm twice, sorry home. about that. All right, so this is an opera that fits in the category of theater of the absurd, uh, in a way. And these are some of the plays that sort of fit in that category as well. Um, Waiting for Godot, The Bald Soprano, The Balcony, Zoo Story, uh, Six Characters in Search of an Author, uh, The Dumbwaiter, Rosencrantz and Gilderstein are dead. Um, they all have this uh, sort of... Uh, absurdist quality that we'll find uh, in this opera as well. Uh, in other words, uh, it's perhaps not worth too much time pondering what it all means. Uh, we can maybe take our own meaning from it, uh, whatever we want it to mean for ourselves. Uh, these are some absurdist operas that fit in the category. Uh, Shostakovich's The Nose, uh, about a man whose nose escapes and he has to uh, go catch it. Uh, a wonderful piece. Uh, the Breasts of Tiresias. Uh, that I have sung. Yeah. A woman who decides she doesn't want to be a woman anymore, so she um, just uh, bids farewell to her breasts and becomes a man. <laughs> uh, Ligeti's uh, The Grand Macabre, which is a sort of a, a farcical, apoc apocalyptic opera. We did it uh, here uh, at San Francisco Opera in the early 2000s. It's kind of like, what if you gave an apocalypse and, and nobody came? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so here is a brief, quick summary. Sherry, do you want to just fill us in on this, of the postcard story? Yes, I mean, it's set in a train station um, and exploring the human minds of these seven travelers. And they're guarding their secrets. Some are carrying 
a, a cornet case and someone else has a hat box and someone else has the cake box and someone else, you know, the woman has this hand mirror that is her prop that she has. So I always, I always say this is an opera for someone who really, when you've ridden on trains and you're in a cabin, like in a European, nice European train, and you're in the cabin with five other people and you're looking around and you're, I make up, I, every time I make up entire stories about their <laughs> lives. I have, I, you, you could ask me and I'll tell you exactly what I think. So, you know, this is an opera for that person in me. I guess I'm the, the curious voyeur. Here I uh -huh. am. Um, so you uh, mentioned that uh, this may or may not be set in a train station and maybe if it's uh, for people from various times, maybe we're in some sort of time warp uh, travel place, maybe a space station or something. Who knows? We'll, well have to wait. I think yeah. David's sort of thinking of it as limbo. It, uh -huh. it, we're not, yeah. you know, that, yeah, where okay. are we going? Where are we going? Is life going to be better or worse? Who knows? <laughs> now, here's a statement from the librettist it's, that's actually in the score. I won't read all this for you. Uh, he talks about the fears and anxieties and uh, uh, the defense, each person sort of guarding their secrets. But I like that last line, poor Mr. Owen, the man with the paint box. He's the guy whose aria we just listened to a little bit of. If you'd only gotten to look into someone else's suitcase and found out uh, what was there. Um, and uh, here is a list of all these people. As you can see, we've got the man with the paint box, as we mentioned, the lady with the hat box, the foreign singer who sings in a, a made-up language. It sounds, you know, you don't, don't try to guess what it is because uh, it's... Uh, no language. Something, no, something at all. Uh, and then we have the lady with the hand mirror. We're going to hear her aria in just a second. The man with old luggage, the shoe salesman, and the man with the cornet case. So uh, they all have their stories that uh, they don't want to tell. Yep. Uh, all right, so here is the lady with the hand mirror. This is a coloratura aria, and uh, thanks to Boozy and Hawks, we can only listen to a few seconds of it, but here we go. Okay, so uh, Sherry, when we get to the cast, you can tell us about uh, casting this role. Obviously, uh, it, um, not just any old singer can uh, can do this part. <laughs> no, there are diminuendos written on high Ds. <laughs> wow. So uh, it takes a real coloratura for this part, for sure. Okay. So another interesting thing about this opera is that uh, it uh, is a tribute to Wagner, uh, and it has its own version of the Souvenir de Bayreuth, which is a, a kind of a European tradition of paying tribute uh, to Wagner by um, sort of uh, satirizing him, if you will, or uh, doing versions of him. And uh, these are a couple of French composers who are famous for their versions of the Souvenir de Bayreuth, uh, 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 perhaps making fun, but in a in an, a sort of a way of homage. And uh, 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 Debussy gets in on this too. You all know the famous Tristan chord, which uh, goes like this. That's the chord. All right. Pretty familiar. And uh, here is WC's little uh, take on that. All right, you get the idea. So the French have uh, been at the forefront of sort of uh, uh, paying homage to uh, Wagner while at the same time uh, spoofing him slightly. And we get that in uh, Postcard as well. For example, we get a little take on this famous melody from Tannhäuser. Uh, 
Uh, well, in the central, uh, extended central scene in the middle of the opera, the Souvenir de Bayreuth, it's called, uh, we get this. <laughs> Kind of a, a jazzy combo going on there. I should mention this production from uh, New England Conservatory. Of course, it's a student production. Um, it follows the stage directions very uh, closely, which is kind of unusual. Stage directors don't typically want to do that. Uh, Not anymore. You all, no, you all know this tune from the Meisterzinger Overture. And here we have it, a la Argento. Now, the uh, stage directions do explain what's supposed to be happening on stage during all this, but of course, we'll have to wait and see what happens in this production. <laughs> and you all know the Valhalla motive from uh, Wagner's Ring. <laughs> Well, let's see what Argento does with it. <laughs> Even in the same key. So lots of potential for interesting stage action here, and we will have to see what uh, transpires next summer. Uh, so let's talk about our cast, Sherry. Um, interesting group, I'm sure, of uh, starting with the lady with the cake box. Yes, she went to Maryland, and we must have heard her in New York City. It's a nice, big, juicy soprano to sing the lady with the cake box. Our last lady with the cake box, uh, went on to sing Norma, so who knows where this mm. girl could be headed. All right. Then we have the man with the coronet case. We know Andy. He was here a couple of years ago, Andrew Dwan, and he's from Mountain View. And uh, so we know Andy very well, and he's a wonderful, tall character. Okay. And then the lady with the hand mirror. This is this coloratura showpiece that we heard a few bars of. And she's the one who sang it for me last year. She sang it the best. And she had all the, I felt like she had all the images down. The, lady, the hand mirror aria is just about one quick image after another. And she just had every image in her head so well. I was always impressed. So she brought that in her audition to you, right? Yes, she did, indeed. Wow, that's a, that takes guts. <laughs> indeed it does. <laughs> if you're a coloratura, you've got to have guts. <laughs> Okay, then we have Mr. Owen, the man with the paint box. Our, he's That's sort of our right. hero. Well, um, again, the man with the paint box is sort of a, it's sort of a big lyric tenor, sort of. It, it wants a nice, thick voice. And this boy reminds me a little bit of our current uh, boy, Victor. So um, anyway, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear Gabrielle do it. And he's a... He's living in Florida now, but he was an army brat, and so he lived all over the United States. And in fact, he said he did his first musical in California, in fact. So, oh, well, he knows about traveling with luggage then. <laughs> and he certainly does. Yes. <laughs> okay, then, speaking of luggage, the man with old luggage. Monsieur L'Espérance, he's from the Massachusetts area, and he comes from a large family of musicians. And they're all singers or musicians of some kind or another, so... 
I love his name too. We really? all need a little Esperance at this point. Here we go. Wonderful uh, operatic name. Yes. Okay, then our shoe salesman. Thomas Lynch, he may be from New York, but Mark Morash knew him from Hawaii Opera Theater where he had been an apprentice out there. And so Tom, uh, Mark knew him from there and it's just a, it's a nice baritone instrument. So okay. this is our Thomas, yeah. And then we talked about the foreign singer who uh, sings in this uh, made up language. Some uh -huh. strange hooty 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 language. <laughs> and Nicola is from around here as well, from Novato. And I, <clears throat> I heard her first at the conservatory. I was judging their concerto competition and we awarded the prize to her. And uh, it's just this amazing instrument that has a lot of range and I have high hopes for this woman. Okay, so that's our cast for Postcard from Morocco. If you have questions about all this, put them into the chat and we'll address them when we, uh, when we uh, finish uh, our little conversation here. Uh, but let's go on now to talk about the marriage of Figaro. Um, you are opera folks, you Marilla supporters, so we don't need to drill you too much on the background here. But I thought I'd fill in maybe some things that uh, were, uh, uh, might, might be interesting that uh, uh, you've forgotten perhaps from your uh, opera studies years ago. Uh, this is Mozart writing to his father. Uh, he says, our court poet here in Vienna now is a certain Abate da Ponte. He is at present writing an entirely new libretto for Salieri. He has then promised to write a new libretto for me, but who knows? As you know, the Italians, these Italians are very civil to one's face. If he's in league with Salieri, I shall never get anything out of him. Uh, it's interesting that he, he was, was an Abate. He was uh, actually born uh, Emanuele Conigliano, uh, born Jewish but converted to Catholicism, became a priest, but a kind of a randy one, got kicked out of Venice for his uh, uh, nefarious dealings with women. But this is him writing, uh, taking all credit for his librettos for Figaro, Giovanni, and Cosi. Although gifted with talent superior, perhaps, to those of any other composer in the world, past, present, or future, Mozart had, thanks to the intrigues of his rivals, never been able to exercise his divine genius in Vienna, and was living there, unknown and obscure, like a priceless jewel buried in the bowels of the earth and hiding the refulgent excellence of its splendors. It was to my perseverance and firmness alone that Europe and the world in a a great part oh the equitate vocal compositions of that admirable genius <laughs> so this is uh uh da ponte sort of taking credit he lived years longer uh 50 years longer than mozart ended up in new york where he became the first uh uh teacher of italian at columbia university he was the first uh catholic on the faculty there and also the first jew so quite a fascinating character and he was a greengrocer as well you know, that's right among many other things and yes. uh uh, I love had that he was a green several person. children, quite a, we don't have time to go into it too much more, but it's a fascinating <laughs> story. And uh, it's, read his memoirs, but don't trust them. He sort of makes up a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, so this is the, the trio that created this opera, Pierre Caron de Beaumarchais. His name was Caron. And some people think that the, the phrase fils Caron, which uh, in sort of French dialect would mean son of Caron, is where we get the name Figaro. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, he created these plays. De Ponte made a libretto out of the, uh, the uh, second one, The Marriage of Figaro, and Mozart, of course, created his masterpiece. Uh, Beaumarchais, an interesting person, too, as you see, a, a man of many parts, as, as you can see here. And again, a fascinating uh, 18th century character to think about. And these are the three plays, The Barber Seville, The Marriage of Figaro, and The New Tartuffe. Uh, Tartuffe, of course, being a... Uh, uh, Moliere character from the 17th century of pious fraud who uh, tries to use his fake religion or fake religious uh, piety to uh, swindle people. And uh, in Mozart's day, the famous Barbara Seville was by a guy named Paisiello. Uh, and then, of course, long after Mozart's death, uh, Rossini came along and created his own Barber of Seville, which kind of blew the Paisiello out of the water. But it's, uh, it's not a bad piece. I actually sang the role of Figaro uh, in my college days back in the University of North Dakota. It's my, it was my only claim to fame uh, in the <laughs> opera world. All right, so this is the, a really fascinating thing about the play. And of course, this is just before the French Revolution, and the play really brings out the, the sort of simmering resentment that would ultimately result in the 
uh, revolution. This is Figaro, uh, who knows that his master, the Count, is trying to get his fiancée, Susanna, in the sack. And he's uh, determined that that ain't going to happen. No, Monsieur le Comte, vous n'aurez pas. Vous n'aurez pas. Parce que vous êtes un grand seigneur. Vous vous croyez un grand génie Noblesse, fortune, un rang, des places, tout cela rend si fier. Qu'avez-vous fait pour tant de bien Vous vous êtes donné la peine de naître Et rien de plus Du reste, homme assez ordinaire. Tandis que moi, mort bleu, perdu dans la foule obscure, il m'a fallu déployer plus de science et de calcul pour subsister seulement, qu'on en a mis depuis 100 ans à gouverner toutes les Espagnes. Et vous voulez jouter So, them's fighting words, obviously. Uh, this is really revolutionary. Now, the idea of servants outwitting their masters, you know, it goes way back to ancient Greece, and it's a big factor in Commedia dell'arte, the Italian sort of street theater, uh, that um, was sort of a part of the birthing process of place like this. But uh, this is something else. This is uh, directly challenging the authority of the nobility uh, to have their, uh, their privileges, saying, you know, you've done nothing. You took, took the trouble to be born. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, pretty, pretty inflammatory. And of course, uh, the emperor in uh, uh, Vienna at the time, Joseph II, uh, would have none of that. He said, forget the play. Uh, but uh, he did allow the opera. You can get away with singing things that you can't always get away with otherwise. But of course, speeches like that had to be toned down. And what we get, Da Ponte uh, gave us this version of the speech, much more metaphorical, not so direct in your face challenging the count, but using this metaphor of teaching him to dance. Uh, you, you know figure, I'm sure most of you. So these are all um, words that probably come to mind. So Figaro is uh, telling the Count, uh, okay, well, you may, uh, you want to dance a little bit and, well, I'm going to play the tune for you. Here is uh, Bryn Terfel coming back after his little Wagner we heard a few minutes ago to uh, give us his version of this speech from uh, Da Ponte. <laughs> Scoprir potrò Darti schermendo, darti l'offrando Dico fuggendo, tira scherzando Tutte le macchine rode se non promesserò Darti schermendo, darti l'offrando Dico fuggendo, tira scherzando Tutte le macchine rode se non Tutte le macchine rode se non Tutte le macchine rode se non Rode se non, rode se non Okay, so the revolutionary aspects are there, but much more toned down, and Mozart Mars music helps a lot. I love the fact that he's singing his defiance to the Count while polishing his boots. <laughs> it's a lovely little <laughs> trick in this production. Yes. Okay, and of course we have a wonderful trouser roll here in this opera. You all know about the tradition of trouser rolls. Composers uh, wrote uh, for uh, mezzo-sopranos portraying teenage boys uh, for musical reasons, obviously. I know how I sounded as a teenage boy. Carabino's maybe, what, 13 or 14, Sherry? And, and, yeah. Uh, just discovered women can't get anything, can't get them out of his mind. You would not want to hear a 13 or 14 year old boy singing this. Instead, we have the wonderful Flicka. <laughs>
So uh, wonderful stuff that uh, we look forward to hearing next summer. Uh, Sherry, I suppose I, you have had these conversations with Lyric Mezzos very often, uh, telling them that they, they uh, have to be uh, used to looking good in pants. That's just a, a factor that uh, happens a lot, doesn't it? Well, yes. When we women play boys, I've only had to do that once in my life when I played Zdenka in Arabella, but oh, yeah. I wasn't supposed to be a real boy at least. Right. I mean, just the sheer binding of the bosoms, which <laughs> occurs, is enough to make you want to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I can tell you. It's not uh, much fun. So. Yeah. Yes, I've uh, watched the binding of the bosoms in the in the dressing rooms. Yes, really. <laughs> yeah. How can you sing after you've uh, you've been bound up like that? It's uh, it's not well, easy. Actually, a lot of singers like a resistance to press against. Oh, uh -huh. a lot of singers enjoy. I mean, I know a lot of tenors wear what they call the tenor belt, mm -hmm. and they actually wear a, a tight elastic around their midsection because they like to feel where that breath is. Something their diaphragm can sort of press against, maybe. Yes, yeah. so that they can feel it more. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, my favorite moment uh, in the opera is the letter duet, uh, which I'm sure most of people, most of you under know the situation. Count the Countess and Susanna are sort of scheming. They're going to catch the Count in his philandering by luring him to a rendezvous in the garden at night. He thinks he's going to hook up with Susanna, but the ladies are going to switch clothing, so he'll be hooking up with his own wife instead. And this, again, is the so-called bed trick, a version of the bed trick, as it's called, that goes way back to the ancient Greeks, uh, this whole idea of men uh, mistakenly, foolishly making love to their own wife. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a new gimmick. Anyway, they just sing up a gorgeous storm as they're composing this letter together. So that's the ending of the duet. Here's the beginning from the last production we did here just last year. All right, so uh, I'm not the only person who loves this uh, music. It features in the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, uh, where, uh, as you may recall, uh, Tim Robbins is a prisoner and he manages to uh, lock the guard in the bathroom long enough to put his favorite music on the prison's PA system. <clears throat>
Italy? I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. Little tribute to Mozart there from Hollywood. Okay, let's talk about our cast, Sherry. We yeah. start with uh, our carabino, the pants roll. Yes, uh, Gabriella Barkidia is uh, in the Chicago area and goes to Northwestern. And so our friend uh, uh, who teaches at Northwestern it, let me know that this girl has perfect pitch. So I can tell you this, this girl sang that aria in tune. She sang <laughs> Oike Zapete in tune, which is one of the hardest things to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. There's our Marcellina, who is the uh, lady who turns out to be Figaro's mother, just to everyone's surprise. Indeed. This young lady who went to school in Georgia, actually, she was in the Met Finals last year and did very, very well for herself. So uh, I'm really looking. This is a beautiful, big, she sang um, uh, the witch uh, aria, you know, and from, had a uh, great speech flat at the end of that. So, uh, from Hansel and Gretel? Yeah, so I'm looking forward to this. Right. This is so a big. We mentioned we, we've, got, we've got two Gabrielles. You said you have three Gabrielles. Is that right? Well, the, our our Mr. Owens is a Gabrielle. Oh, of course, yeah. As I said, you're going to have to come up with nicknames for these people, or there's going to be a lot. Definitely, of right. Gaby has to be one of them. Gaby, right? <laughs> really? Okay, then here's the Antonio, the drunken gardener. I played that role in college too. <laughs> well, Ben. I know Ben because he was uh, he was in our extra chorus at the opera, you know, catching, you know, making a few extra bucks for himself this year. But he's also been singing around the area as well. And he's a big, tall, strapping guy with this big, tall, strapping baritone, you know. So I'm looking forward to seeing him progress. Yeah. OK. Our Don Curzio, the judge. Yes, this is a beautiful voice. He's singing a little role but we will feature him elsewhere you know and uh he goes to cincinnati conservatory and uh he's yeah this very very beautiful uh it, it's an italianate sound of course it's a beautiful italianate voice right so, yeah, there'd be name, a luxurious don curzio believe with me. A, a name like cardamone you would expect it to be uh exactly. Italian sound, exactly. right? okay then our dr bartolo uh he's he's this wonderful it went to Manhattan School of Music, but I I know him a little through my friend Vincent Cole because Vincent was working with him at Kansas City at the opera at Kansas City. He was one of their apprentices there. And he's this big guy with a sense of humor. And I think he could be one of the great buffos, you know, if he if he wanted to be, because he has that sense of timing and uh, cleverness. I think he's great. very interesting. Great. Yeah. Okay, then our Barbarina. Uh, Magdalena Kuzman. She is um, from New York, indeed, and, and goes to Juilliard School of Music. And um, she actually went to, she's Polish by heritage, and she only spoke Polish for a long time at home when she moved, when they were in the States. And she went to Polish um, uh, um, grade school. So she wow. really, she's bilingual for sure. <laughs> That's what we That's can say. And our count. Yes, Samson uh, went to Cincinnati Conservatory, even though he's from Arizona. And he's a very sensitive guy, I think. And I think he'll be very interesting as the count as well. He's been in the Washington National Program for several years now. OK. Beautiful guy. And our Figaro. Our dear boy, Loriano, who our members know from uh, whenever it was, whenever we saw him last. Uh, he's sitting down in Colombia at the moment, of course, but he'll be joining. He was at Manhattan, but he's going to join uh, forces at Yale School of Music in the fall, probably mm -hmm. now. And right. um, 
but his hair was even longer when we saw him this summer. So <laughs> I wonder where it is now. <laughs> yeah. All right. And our Susanna. Uh, Ashley Marie. She goes to Curtis and uh, she's from Massachusetts, but she is a, she's a go-getter and she, yeah, she thought, I think of her like Susanna. She's very clever and she'll be one of the smart ones on the stage. That's for sure. Really? She's a smart girl and very energetic and has strong opinions on things. Good. Yeah. And the Countess. Lovely girl from Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, but has been in the States quite a while and is working on a green card, I think, even. So i um, been going to school in the States and um, just a lovely, nice, creamy Countess, we hope. Mm -hmm. She's got that classy aspect you need exactly. for a Countess, right? Exactly. A classicist, a classical singer. Right. For sure. Okay. And uh, our Basilio, our schemer. Again, we have, that's the one thing Mark and I always would uh, say, one of the treats of Marilla is when you, you, the little roles are taken by these incredible young singers, you know. So here we have Don Basilio is going to be sung by Wu Young Yun, who could be singing uh, Tonio in Daughter of the Regiment, you know. It's this beautiful voice and so we'll have a treat again of having this beautiful tenor singing don basilio great yeah all right so that is our marriage of figaro cast but that's not all uh coming up this summer we also have the uh schwabacher summer concert uh do we know who's going to conduct that sherry yes um that will be our friend ari pelto maestro pelto who's uh, associated with opera colorado and uh, a friend of Marilla has been here many times. So okay. I think we look forward to that. And we'll be featuring singers who don't have major roles in the two staged operas. Uh, Jesse Mashburn, is that how you say that? Yes, Jesse is, uh, she has this nice, big, mm, thick mezzo. I love it. You know, we don't, I always say, you, if you, you think you're a mezzo, you have to prove it to me. <laughs> because, <laughs> So many mezzos are really sopranos in hiding, but <laughs> this is a mezzo. I can assure you of that. All right. And uh, Celeste? Uh, lovely Celeste. Went to Manhattan School of Music. Uh, has so many interests. She's a, she's a photographer and actually does headshots for people. And she's interested in documentaries. But she has one of the, she'll be singing some uh, Suar Angelica for you. Because this is one of those voices that you just, this nice plummy soprano, you just oh. want to hear Puccini. Puccini just voice. Puccini. <laughs> okay. And then Johanna? Johanna Will. Now, this is our European. She's actually coming to us from Germany. Uh, although her mother is American, but her father is German, and she actually grew up in Germany and attended conservatory in, in, uh, in the Hamburg, I think. The combo conservatory and she's got this big dramatic coloratura like you can see that in her she looks like mm -hmm. that and it's this beautiful a beautiful instrument to match the beautiful girl okay and then i love this name isabel signore that's very uh operatic sounding i know she went to rice and uh, studied with uh, dr king down there and my favorite she's going into the to vienna into the program in Vienna, and she is the girlfriend of our past Marilini, Josh Lovell. And Josh is also in Vienna. So the two of them are going to be joining forces in Vienna probably right about now. I would okay. think they're there now. But this is a lovely, lovely young mezzo. Very great. exciting. Yeah. Oh, great. And uh, another tenor from Asia. Yeah. Chen Ji. He's, he's one of these. You see that big square head? And he's got this sort of little square body and everything. And it's just one of those nice, thick tenors. You know, you just, I look forward to hearing this voice again. It's a beautiful, beautiful instrument. Great. So, yeah. Okay. And we also have our apprentices uh, that are joining us. And let's talk about them. We start with uh, Audrey Chait. Is that how she says it? Yes, Audrey Chait. She's um, currently at Cincinnati Conservatory working on a uh, DMA, and uh, but went to Brown University as a, a, a playwright. So you know she uh, she's obviously 
studied construction, you know, so she has a very strong foundation in how to, um, you know, how to construct scenes, you know, that's, if, I think if you're a playwright, it gives you a nice advantage on understanding mm -hmm. opera, I hope, anyway, but so very be, bright. She'll very be doing the concert staging for the Schwabacher concert then, is that right? No, she does the, she does the Marilyn Grand Finale. Oh, the Grand Finale, aha, okay, yeah. even better. So, Okay. And I know she's up to the job. <laughs> sure. Okay, then uh, Young Lin. Young Lin also came from Cincinnati Conservatory. So a lot of them will know each other, I guess. And where he studied with Cameron Stowe, Jonathan Feldman, Kathleen Kelly, who we, we know who conducted for us a few summers ago. Mm -hmm. And he also <laughs> in China had studied with Gu Wei and Catherine Chu. And Catherine Chu is a very, was a very important person for us in that she was a link into China for certain singers as well, like Ao Li came to us from mm -hmm. Catherine Chu. So here's another one right here. Great. Okay. And then Michael McElvain? McElvain, yes. He's one of Martin Katz's students and uh, University of Michigan. And um, yeah, he he's had a little health issue this last summer. So we're hoping he's fine and we're looking forward to having him with us next summer. Great. Okay, and I'm, I won't attempt this name. You can tell me how to say it. Shmigelskaya, I think. Shmigelskaya. Anna, yeah, she went to Manhattan School of Music, and so she's a Warren Jones um, student, which, of course, you know, we usually have Warren with us, and so she'll get schooled some more when he's here with her. Right, but she's originally and, from Russia. Yes, she is, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. And then our last one, Shi Yu Tan is also a, is also a Warren Jones student, so we'll have the Warren Jones click next summer of the pianist. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so, but she also is Manhattan School of Music, so you know, and yeah. we have to. I I must say we have to thank those people like Warren and Martin who are devoted to teaching these kids how to keep up with the singers. Uh huh. Yeah, we're well, just keep we're, up with us and keep us going. Challenging and be able to sight read all that stuff. It's uh, I'm always amazed when they play auditions, the stuff that gets thrown at them, and they oh, just tackle amazing. it easily. And Mark right. Morash always did a really, really complicated um, audition. So, right. And I, then, I remember oh some my of goodness, it. I don't have anything on on Miss Yasuda. However, she is Japanese, which is also a little unusual for us. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, um, because the Japanese, I think, have a pretty good conservatory system, and we don't always see the Japanese either, but we have one now. So that's All right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So that is our group. Uh, we've talked about the two shows and the concert. And uh, maybe now it's time for me to get out of screen share here. And we'll ask uh, our executive director of Marilla Jean Keller to rejoin us and see if we have. Uh, I see lots of questions in the chat there, Jean. What, uh -oh. uh, what do people want to know? Well, we have one question here about Figaro, and it is, is the fact it's an Italian of any import in getting past the, the, the ruler? Uh, wondering if the emperor was perhaps less fluent in Italian? I doubt it. No, I think the, uh, it was just the fact that this was an Italian theater uh, that was ran there, and, and uh, Da Ponte was the court poet. You know, he, he worked for the emperor. It was his job as part of the imperial establishment there. Uh, as we know, Mozart uh, fell into place when the emperor briefly decided to start a German theater uh, there in Vienna, and that's where uh, the abduction from the Seraglio uh, came from. But uh, no, I think... Uh, Opera was in Italian, pretty much in Vienna, so that's why Figaro's in Italian. <laughs> and of course, Da Ponte was Italian, so he wrote Italian libretti. Right. Here's what I noticed there are, I heard a lot of jazz elements in Postcard from Morocco. What is the instrumentation and how much uh, modern music is there in that opera? Kind of, kind of a chamber ensemble, isn't it, Sherry? Yeah, it's only about 12 pieces, I think, in the orchestra. And so, one of the things that, for instance, in Mr. Owen's aria, I'm a sucker for a clarinet. And so there's this, he uses clarinet very poignantly in this, in the opera. So it's a very small ensemble. And, um, and that's why certain instruments sort of click out, you know, and so you, you get that clarinet a lot. 
it, he does come through. So it's very small. Yeah, I don't have the orchestration on me here. I don't have the. Sorry, I don't here. either. I should have uh, should have brought the yeah, score along with me. That. I didn't think of that either. Uh, but as we heard it, you know, him jazzing up those Wagner tunes like "Oh Evening Star," he kind of gave that a uh, kind of a jazz. And also, there's <laughs> always both he and like Conrad Souza. We've done uh, Conrad's uh, yeah. transformations every day. Big um, batteries of drums and things. So you've got yeah. lots of bells and bells and whistles basically so you get lots of percussion instruments right one percussionist but lots yeah, of that's the thing about percu the composers like to write for them because you get a lot of different variety of sounds from one player yeah good idea fantastic um we did have a question about the dates for next summer. Those will be coming soon. Uh, <laughs> we haven't, I don't think we have advertised them yet, but since everybody already knows what the season is going to be, I'm sure that will be up soon. It's gonna be relatively the, the same as our usual summers where we'll have, um, we will have the Schwabacher Summer Concert in early July. Um, we will have Postcard from Morocco in late July. Mary de Figaro in early August, and then of course the Mary Le Grand finale in later in August. Um, here's a question. Uh, what are some challenges in presenting an opera with such a small cast from postcard, obviously? Well, I think the challenge is you have to get the casting right. You know, you have to have um, postcard. You want kids who are very able to move. Um, they usually end up having to dance because we don't do, we don't do, we don't like to bring in a lot of extras or like the score technically asks for puppets and all of that. And David's not going to be doing that. That's expensive. So, <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. So um, it's really about getting the casting right with a small cast. Well, with any cast really, but um, yeah because they stand out so much in this one, you know, there's no hiding behind anything. Everybody has a moment. And that's another reason why it's a good training program uh, piece because every character sort of does shine for a certain moment. And so it's it's a nice vehicle for young singers, I think. Great, and we do have one interesting question about next summer, which is, will singers and orchestra musicians have to socially distance on stage, or will things be back to normal? Well, <laughs> you have to quote Yogi Berra, the fat, famous Italian American, who said, "It's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future." <laughs> but indeed, we are looking into all of those elements of socially distancing, of um, COVID testing, of our young artists, of how we're going to manage this. We're following uh, San Francisco Opera and what they are doing, what they are looking into. We are also looking at the conservatory where we'll be doing a lot of our rehearsals and the Schwabacher Summer Concert. So we will be following their rules and they are right now doing a lot of that with their school. So we do have some good models to follow. We wanna keep it safe for our audience and our orchestra musicians and our young artists. Definitely, yeah. Well, I think that's all we have for the questions. Um, and I wanted to say thank you so much to Sherry and Kip. Um, and I also want to let our wonderful audience, uh, fabulous members who have supported us for so, so long and, and, and so graciously and so generously, thank you, thank you for keeping Marilla afloat during these difficult times. Very, very appreciative. And one of the things that we're doing is offering these online virtual recitals. And we had one with Lucas Meacham and his wife, Irina, just recently, which was spectacular, coming from Minneapolis in an old warehouse. It was just beautiful. And uh, so that was a huge success. Our next one comes up on Sunday, November 22nd, and we're featuring our pianists, which we have not done before in the past. It's with Tamara Sanikidze performing live from Austin, Texas, and Eduardo Barsotti, who is pre performing from the Teatro de Maggio Musicale in Florence, Italy. Uh, on Saturday, December 12th, will be a very Marilla holiday with some of our favorite young artists from recent past, Maria Valdez, Alice Chung, Casey Candebat, Christian Purcell, and all accompanied with by Ronnie Michael Greenberg. It will be a recital of holiday and operatic favorites. 
Then on Sunday, February 7th, we welcome Karen Slack, uh, a Merrill alum, and Mary Pinto, pianist, live from Philadelphia in a show called Of The I Sing, Songs of Love and Justice. You can look it up on our website. They're all there, uh, very affordable, and we hope to see you online um, at, at some of these recitals. Again, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your wonderful support, and we so look forward to seeing you in person, uh, in the, hopefully in the near future. Thank you all, and good night.